it's abuse beyond abuse. It's it's abuse beyond abuse. And then um, so he he won full custody of our girls, and then my older kids. He went to their father, collaborated with their father, so that he uh -huh. would win full custody of my older kids. For them, I did. They didn't even hold a hearing. They I literally didn't even have a hearing, and the judge said you get full custody. So I mean, it's it's that bad. Like, and that's just arrogant to be that corrupt and to not. You know, I mean, that's that's arrogance yeah. right there. So yeah. I do have people looking yeah. into things. You know, there's still. Yeah. So I guess the stalking. Let's talk about the stalking for a minute. Yes. You know, yes. I made that comment about not being alive. Um, so he after he left the home and we had separated, the conversation between us was we're taking a breather. This has gotten out of hand. We're fighting too much. We just need a breather. I didn't know anything about the recordings yet. Um, I found out about that later. But uh, but that was the conversation between us. We're going to try again six months, a year. You know, let's just spend some time apart and then we'll try again. He was right. still coming over at night for sex. Like we were still, you know, in some ways still right. pretending that we were a couple. But then what I started to notice is his the way that his friends and family were treating me was like they were getting a different story from what I was getting. And so I that was really kind of the thing that triggered me and was. And then I found a therapist and the, immediately my therapist was like, you ever heard of the narcissist empath dance? And, um, <laughs> so, you know, so then there I started studying narcissism. I got a couple of books. Um, and as, as I learned more, I became stronger and I was like, I don't want any part of this. Like you need to leave me alone. Um, so, yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. So. Wait, wait, wait. High five from a distance. Give me a high five. Give me a high five. There you go, guy. You got to leave me alone. I like that. Hashtag leave me alone. Hashtag leave me alone. Dark free. Dark free. Yeah, dark free. Yeah, there you go. So, so then when I stopped sleeping with him, uh, he started sending gifts so that just to kind of oh, really? yeah, <laughs> really? to try to re you reel me back in. So I was getting flowers and gift baskets and things like that. Um, and then when that didn't work, he started just covertly entering the home. And so he oh, had a wow. lot of financial abuse um, where everything was in his name. I contributed monetarily to everything, but he kept it all in his name. And um, so there was a lot of financial abuse. That's his biggest PowerPoint. So then he's covertly entering the home. He, he broke into the house on the most important day of my career. I had planned a conference and it was the day of the conference. So that, and his intention was that, you know, the alarm had been set. He knew that I had changed the alarm codes. I told him I was changing the alarm codes. Um, and this was before anything got scary. So I, at the time, it wasn't a stupid thing for me to tell him that. But now, you know, me saying that, well, sounds yeah, hey, stupid. Hey, you know, but at the time, I still trusted him. I didn't know. I didn't know what he was capable of. So he broke into the house with the intention of my phone going crazy, telling me that somebody was in my house. Right. Like while I'm at this conference that I had spent months and months planning and, and executing and everything. Um, mm -hmm. So. So then he he just keeps entering the home every time he knows that I took the kids camping a lot that summer. And so every time he knew that we were not going to be there, he would come in house. Um, and he even came in. There was a protective order in place when he came in at one point, at least one time, uh, probably mm -hmm. more. And um, right. and that time he messed with there was a chandelier that hung above my front door. And it was okay. like it, this was a two story high ceiling. You know, I don't know. Twenty feet. What is that? Two stories. 20 feet ish. Sure, um, say 20 feet. That's fine. So the chandelier mm -hmm. went about halfway down, you know, so none of the kids could have reached it, like impossible for kids. Right, to right. Reach it. it was 10 feet mm -hmm. near at least, maybe 12. So I notice I look up one day and I notice that it's different. Something is wrong. And so I got a ladder and I climbed up there and there were fingerprints on it. And then the, um, you know, the ring that like connects it to the ceiling. Um, yes. Mm -hmm. That had obviously been moved because, you know, if you move those after they've been there for years, there's like a dirt or a, a ring, right, or got something, it. whatever. So that had obviously shifted. And so I took pictures of everything, took them to court, tried to get another protective order, was like, look, he violated the last protective order. Um, and, you know, and here it's so blatantly obvious that he's been in the house. The police wouldn't take fingerprints because they were like, well, he lived here. What's the point of taking fingerprints? Which, you know, I guess makes sense. But at the same time, hmm. they should have done a lot more. They've, they've not done yeah. anything. Um, but, uh, but his testimony at the protective order hearing about that was that he and my older children would use a glass chandelier as a target for Nerf guns. And he says this to the judge. <laughs> 
and she bought it and she t and then she told me that I'm not credible and she told him that he is credible and I was like hold up he just told you that he teaches children to use a glass chandelier as a target for nerf guns and you're telling me that he's credible and I'm not like really is this reality like <laughs> this is like a really bad movie right <laughs> He had an account that he intentionally set up a bridge account. So this security company, uh, you can have what's called a bridge account, which means if you own like multiple properties and have their security system installed in different properties, you can use a single login to view all of your different properties. Oh, okay. Okay. So he, uh -huh. so he intentionally installed this company's security system on the new house that he purchased for himself after we separated um, so that he could get a bridge account so that he could watch and you know have access to my security system um so like i said he was so arrogant he didn't even wait a whole day like later that night after he won that protective order hearing he went back in and um and i got a notification it was the last notification i ever got but it said that um he had changed you got a notification his, notification from the security company i'm just you got it. okay yeah. okay he, yeah. he had changed my email address taken it off the account and put an alternative one of his email addresses on in place of mine so that i would never know if he was doing anything in the security system or things like that so the day that i lost the protective order hearing i had been staying with my kids in a women's shelter and so um, when I lost that hearing, the first thing that I did was I went home and I just completely cut off all power to the system. I didn't do anything to it because I didn't want to like be accused of vandalism or anything like that. Right, right, but right, I, right. it was a it's a it was a hardwired installed one. So right, I right. cut off all power. I took the batteries out. I just, you know, completely shut it down and bought a new system that he had no even. Right. Yeah. Um, Good for you. Good for you. So that took way too long. I should have done that way sooner. But it, I, you know, when you're in trauma brain and you're in that kind of survival mode, you don't think clearly. <laughs> and if you look at what's happened, I mean, he's literally taken my entire world from me. He took my, um, he took my home. He took my cars. He took all of my money. He took um, my children from me. He took everything. He, my career, literally everything he took from me. Like. And he has no guilt or conscience about any of this no. whatsoever. Like, no. is it really that far fetched to think that no. he would take my life too? I mean, he's taken everything. No. Scary nights. There were a lot of nights that I would sleep at girlfriends' houses, and like we would leave my car in the Walmart parking lot, and then she would drive me, and like crazy stuff like that. Like nobody should have to live like this, right? And so, um, so then I take the threat assessment. And I went to an event with some girlfriends and there was one woman there who we were more like acquaintances. We've become closer now, but um, we she and I were more of acquaintances than actual friends at the time. But she looked at me and she said, I've been in a stalking situation before. I know what you're going through. She said, I know people. Oh. I'm a phone call away. If you need me, I'm a phone oh, call wow. away. And so that, that kind of so cool. simmered, that simmered with me for a couple of days there. And I, I don't remember how many days it was, but I think it was definitely less than a week. And um, and I just couldn't get that out of my head. Like, somebody can help me, you know, kind of a thing. Um, and so right, finally, right. one day, I took that threat assessment. And as soon as I took that threat assessment, I called her and I said, I need help and I need help now. And, um, oh. and she said, all right, sit tight. Uh, I'll call you back in a minute. So um, so then she basically got me a plane ticket. I didn't even know where I was going. I just she just said, get on the plane. And so, wow. you know, the, it was, that was an incredibly difficult period because I knew I was going to have to say goodbye to my kids and that was going to be the last time that I was going to see them for a while. And so, you know, if we get into that, I'm going to start crying. So, um, but where I ended up going was Hawaii and um, thank God she sent me to Hawaii and I was on the island of Kauai. And as soon as I got there, everybody started telling me without even knowing much about my story, they were like, this is where people come to heal this. There's something about this island that just heals people. And what I did is I used it as my healing, um, I don't know, helper, I guess. Um, and I was still, yeah, uh -huh. there, you know, and I was still doing what I needed to do to take care of myself. Um, but every single time something would happen, where I would get a motion that they filed or I would get an email from his attorney or, you know, whatever, whatever it was, something stressful, something that caused that stress response. I would go straight to the water and I would just let the water, the water just heals you. That ocean water, it just heals you. And so I would just get in the water and, you know, I, I cried in that water. I, I cried a lot in the ocean out there in Hawaii. 
Um, but, you know, thank God, thank God that that's where I was able to go. In a women's shelter, I spent the first two months there in a women's shelter. And that was another interesting one, because when I got there, I called them, told them, you know, a little bit of my story. They said they were a little bit hesitant because I'm not from Hawaii. And they, so they were a little bit hesitant. They said, come on over. Um, we'll give you a safe place for tonight and we'll we'll talk. And so, um, so I went to the women's shelter, and uh, and when I got there, you know, the director was there, and we talked for a few minutes, but I was stressed, and it was just, you know, you're in trauma brain. I mean, really, you're yeah, in trauma yeah, brain. Yeah. Um, and she yeah. she basically said, all right, I'm going to let you sleep here for tonight. You're not from Hawaii. I just can't let you stay more than one night. But go, you know, mm -hmm. get safe for tonight. Let your – just rest a little bit, and then we'll talk again tomorrow. So the next day I talked to her again and I told her more and more of my story. And um, the more I told her, the more she, at, by the end of the conversation, she was like, you've got a 30 day pass, just, you're good. We just want you to be safe. Uh, um, that's cool. And he did end up finding me in Hawaii, which was part of why I left Hawaii. Um, so he, you know, the stocking still hasn't stopped. I mean, still hasn't stopped. He doesn't know where I am now, um, but, uh, but yeah, he did still, find me in Hawaii. And I'm pointing all of this out to the police, to the family court, like, look, he's still right. stalking, still stalking, guys, come on. It's about, yeah. And yeah. it just, none of it matters. That's what's so crazy about it, is none of it matters. Part of what I'm doing, part of why I'm speaking out, part of, I, I'm leaving a feminist trail on the internet, basically, um, and my story and all of that kind of stuff, women's empowerment and things like that, not, not being anti-men in any way, shape or form. On your page, you put, I have become Unabusable. Exactly. What, do you, what do you mean by that? I mean, what do you mean I, by that? I feel it in my heart and soul now that um, there's there's a difference, and it's been a shift. I won't date right now because um, I still, when I've been attracted to a man in the last year and a half since our separation, I still feel that kind of almost clinginess, like neediness. And so, as long yeah, as I'm still yeah, feeling that, yeah. like I just, I'm, I'm not. Yeah. It's not worth it. Yeah. You know, if if this right. is the result of that, then it's just not worth it.